So I'm going to call to order this uh, special meeting of the uh, Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees and got uh, note for the record that everyone is in attendance except for Veronica, who I think is probably on Peter. in Peter, who's, uh, who's in China. Uh, no. No, no, no. We thought you were Veronica. <laughs> so uh, we can all stand to, uh, for those who wish to participate, say the Pledge of Allegiance. Of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, this is our time for public comment on those items that are not on the agenda. That I don't actually. This one is. So there would be none, even though it says no, here. Yes. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> yes, no. That's not what it says, but that's okay. not Well, sorry. Even though we're not doing that, I'm going to uh, <laughs> make an announcement about public comments in general. Um, I just want to state that once public comment has concluded. The rules do not allow additional comments from the public. At a recent meeting, there, a member uh, passed a note to the board during the meeting. Uh, so the prohibition about commenting after public comments extends to passing notes to board members during the meeting. And this event led me to confirm with legal counsel that the rules prohibit passing notes to board members during the meeting. If despite this prohibition, a note is passed to a board member, the rules also require that the note be shared with all board members. And with that, we move to item 4.1, Supplemental Employment Retirement uh, Program. And um, I'm not sure who's going to present. You have public comment on the item? There is public, thank you. We have three comments. The, the, you put them up there. Thank you. Thank you for all your help. Okay, we start with Cornelia Alzheimer. Oh, okay. All right. So, honorable members of the Board of Trustees, President Miller, uh, Dr. Benjamin, um, so let me start out with my appreciation for all of you, the time and work you put into your service, and I want to thank you for that. And uh, we have a special meeting today, and in front of you, you have a proposal and a resolution about a retirement incentive plan, also known, and, uh, known as SERP. I am not here today to discuss if this is a good idea or not. I have been only informed about this plan shortly before noon yesterday and then saw the material last night. I have not had time to analyze underst and understand this proposal. And most importantly, I have not been able to discuss this with my group, the Faculty Association. But there are a few things that I do know, and these I would like to share with you. One. This is a proposal of great magnitude, not only fiscally, but in terms of impact on the college. Number two, there are significant concerns about having a CERP so soon after we had another one, or previous one, I believe it's four years ago. There was literally no communication whatsoever with any one of our when on campus outside of president's cabinet until yesterday. Number four, this total lack of communication. 
I believe is a serious problem. Number five, in case anyone is unaware, I'm, I'm sure you are aware, but I wanted to uh, repeat this. Any retirement incentive is a mandatory item of collective bargaining. That means a CERP has to be negotiated with the CSEA, the ALA, and the Faculty Association. And this clearly has not happened yet. All things considered, I believe that any vote today would be premature. And I would urge you to please discuss the proposal, but also hear and listen to any concerns you might, in addition to my comment, here today and vote another day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Patricia Stark. Hello, um, I'm going to read. So as Cornelia pointed out, not much time um, to put together thoughts. So less than a week ago, I stood before you and tried to describe in my um, Academic Senate President's presentation the multiple ways that faculty members are involved in shared decision making at Santa Barbara City College. I did this because it's important in the Wild West that is now Santa Barbara City College these days that I make a clear statement to you, to the administration, and to our faculty that we are not being winnowed out of the leadership of Santa Barbara City College, that our faculty voices are still heard and valued. Well, don't I feel like a dupe? Um, I wish Cornelia stated, I don't need to restate it again, the um, quickness by which this was communicated, the lack of shared governance. I wish I could intelligently and confidently tell you how the faculty feels about this SERP which was announced yesterday afternoon via an email um, by Dr. Benjamin and Cornelia and I were notified with a phone call in the middle of the day. But I can't do that. Other than a half dozen panic phone calls last night, I really have no way of knowing how our faculty feels. This is despite the fact that the 10 plus 1 areas under the Academic Center purview include processes for institutional planning and budget development. I do know that our Senate's Planning and Resources Committee and its chair, Katie Laris, is here today. Um, last week discussed the SERP, and this is the Senate group. This is our committee that is most knowledgeable about college resources and its finances. They discussed the, discussed the SERP at length, and they informally rejected it. Um, here is a summary of their discussion that was sent to me via email. SERP needs to be resisted by the faculty. The last SERP didn't appear to save the college much money, and we are still dealing with the problems from the great turnover in our top echelons of management and administration. Those faculty pushing for SERP are doing so out of self-interest and not because it would actually help the college. So let me make a couple of things clear. I actually am speaking for myself today and not as the Academic Senate President, because I can't. Um, but I am someone who's been a daily witness to the disruption the last SERP wrought on this campus. I am also today arguing against my own personal self-interest because I could take advantage of this SERP. I'm of an age. I have the right number of um, I have the right number of years, and I'm almost ready for with for in terms of retirement income. And in many ways, that would be a blessed relief. But I'm the only full-time faculty member in my department, and if I leave, who replaces me? Who will be department chair? Who will hire the adjuncts needed to replace me and teach our classes? Who will compile the schedule of classes? Who will conduct faculty evaluations? Who will update curriculum? And who goes to the Academic Senate next year to fight for a full-time replacement to secure the future of what is one of the most decorated journalism programs in the state? And I'm choosing not to discuss today the loss in faculty leadership, so should I choose to walk away? So here are some things I'm asking you to consider today. The financial benefit of the SERP is literally built on destabilizing the instructional departments and student services, student um, support services at this college. We will be losing experienced faculty college-wide, and the SERP's financial benefit depends on those faculty members either being replaced with less expensive adjuncts or not replaced at all. The Senate this month is painstakingly ranking new and, and replacement faculty positions with the retirements that we already know about, 14 requests for new and replacement faculty. We consider this one of the most important jobs that we do. 
Ours is a carefully controlled and well-timed process designed to ensure faculty members are replaced in the most critical areas. This SERP completely upends that process. We have heard time and again about the difficulty many departments have finding adjuncts. Medical imaging, nursing, computer science, biology, even geology. Who knew? We found out last week. These departments literally cannot find qualified candidates to teach during the day who would be willing to work at a fraction of what they can make at their professional jobs. They cannot find the adjunct faculty. With the SERP, these departments will not be able to meet the demand for classes because they won't have instructors to teach them. And turning away students, how does that save us money? I cannot overstate how much damage the last SERP inflicted on our college. We lost more than one out of three managers and administrators, often replacing them with far less experienced outsiders. And I'm choosing my wording very carefully here, but I am going to say what I'm going to say. We have now had three EVPs in five years. The very public ouster of our last superintendent president, this is the only opportunity you're going to hear for faculty to speak, so I really hope I'm allowed to talk. The very public ouster of our last superintendent president, and he was ousted, let's be clear on that, whom this board hired was a low point in our college's history. If I chose to violate confidentiality, I could describe the difficulty your hired consultant has had recruiting applicants for the open superintendent president position. The revolving door of other administrators is obvious, and the chaos some have caused is something that we live with every day. I'm now in my 29th year at Santa Barbara City College, and faculty has never been so united in its lack of confidence in its administration. This is something I have worked very hard at great personal sacrifice to counter, and today I feel betrayed. At your meeting last month, you made the point that you've been asking the administration to resolve the structural deficit for years, and nothing's been done. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of other things that haven't been done at Santa Barbara City College. Why is Dr. Benjamin having to push so hard for a revised mission statement before she leaves in December. The educational master plan, strategic directions. Why last week were you asked to approve a student equity plan the first time you ever laid eyes on it? The college-wide foundational planning that should be ongoing has largely collapsed. This is no one's person's fault, or all of our faults actually. We in leadership positions spend most of our time in crisis. With our institutional culture in disarray, our trust extinguished, and our capacity for difficult decisions decimated, we swing from one high-profile debacle to the next. That is the instability wrought by your last SERP. Throughout all of this, the one stable factor has been faculty, and I will also add to this our longtime classified colleagues. But with our tenure and lifetime guarantee of secure employment, we have been the glue that has held this college together. So what do you propose to do now? Serve out the most experienced, the most moderate faculty members you have and disrupt the one remaining stable element at Santa Barbara City College. So we have three ways, realistically, that we can reduce the structural deficit at SBCC. We can serve people out, or we can lay people off. That's what's being presented publicly. We have one choice, one or the other. We serve or we lay people off. So we'll pit us against each other, why don't you, okay? Or we can produce, uh, we can increase productivity and efficiency. We can also buy some time till February when we finally see how the chancellor's office will fund the new student sending for formula. We don't know. We're working on opposition. Dr. Ralston last week held the first meeting of the Strategic Enrollment Management Committee, a vital effort that lay dormant after Paul Jarrell left the college at the end of his two-year tenure. This cross-constituency committee will look at every aspect of how we attract, recruit, and retain our, stu retain our students. It's an effort that's long overdue at SBCC. Please give the college time to let that group do its work for improved productivity to develop, to develop in an organic college-wide consensus. You also have reserves, 27 million, if I read the budget correctly, as of mid-September. You have stated repeatedly that you want to save that money when the college is in crisis, but if you don't see that we're in crisis right now, you just aren't looking clearly enough. Please don't look at the figures on a page and fail to appreciate the real cost-benefit analysis of this proposed SERP. Please acknowledge that you are trustees of Santa Barbara City College, and you hold in your trust more than the imperative to balance a budget by May the 10th. Please look at all the unintended consequences of your decision and act accordingly. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Lowe's.
Okay. We will proceed with, uh, I think that's the only three we have. We proceed with uh, presentation on item 4.1, but before we do that, I want to uh, comment that consistent with what Cornelia told us. Uh, the board is being asked to, what we're being asked to approve today is subject to a collective bargaining with respect to represented employees. But because of the time urgency of the matter and to avoid the need to lay off employees, the board is being asked to adopt a resolution in item 4.2 today without delay with the understanding that it will be brought to the bargaining table as it concerns represented employees. So with that, we can proceed with our presentation. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Maureen Toll, Senior Vice President of PARS, Public Agency Retirement Services. And we were asked by the district to do an analysis of the feasibility of offering uh, an early retirement incentive, a SERP as, as we call it, uh, in this fiscal year. And just a little bit of background on PARS. Uh, we were established in 1984. Actually, we started doing uh, SERPs back in 1984. The first community college district we did was, was that year. And uh, that's one of our specialties where, as the name implies, we focus on sort of niche retirement uh, analysis and plans in the public sector. We have over a 1,000 clients, about 850 in California. Uh, we've done services for 44 community colleges, and we've done analysis reports over 4,000 times. So we have a tremendous amount of experience in this area. We're headquartered in um, Orange County, and we've had about 375,000 CERT participants over the years. And those are some of our community colleges. Just to note, uh, Los Angeles Community College District was the largest community college district SERP that we did. We did that a couple years ago, but we've done a number of other ones. Um, as well as a number of school districts all through this central area, coast area, Santa Barbara School District, um, you know, from Atascadero down to Ventura, really all through California, but quite a number of school districts and community colleges in this area. So uh, the SERP process, as we've discussed, is to uh, for the board to approve um, opening several windows, and I'll go into the proposed timeline. One would be this fall for retirements by December 31st, and one would be in the spring for retirements by June 30th. Both of these windows are uh, on a contingency basis, meaning that the board is green lighting opening a, a window but then after the window closes, PARS would do a post-analysis based on the actual uh, employees that are accepting the uh, incentive to evaluate replacement costs analysis, you know, how they're going to replace. And then that would fine-tune the analysis. Right now we're doing projections because we don't know, uh, you know, obviously exactly who's going to be taking. So, um, so in, the, in December as well as again in April, after the close of the windows, then uh, that it would go back to the board each time to evaluate whether it makes sense from a fiscal and operational um, objectives. So, um, so we would look: to, does it save money? Does it have operational impacts that are acceptable or problematic? And and it's contingent. So, um, based on the results, the board can determine if the plan proceeds for that particular window or not. And, and if it proceeds, the employees would resign by December 31st or June 30th. If it doesn't proceed, then it would be canceled and the resignation letters would be revoked. But that's the concept of it, um, as we discussed. Um, I'm actually, we've made some slight changes to this window uh, dates, proposed dates. Um, on the handout that you have, the main change is that we proposed uh, closing the, the second window in the spring uh, March 31st rather than May 1st. And so there's there's some information on that. So basically what would happen is uh, if the board approved opening the window, individual benefit illustrations would be sent out in a packet to each 
eligible employee. And, and then uh, we would hold group orientations, they have one-on-one -on -one meetings through the window and provide services to make sure that the employees understand what the offer is. Uh, and that would be repeated twice for the first and second window. And uh, so they would have to uh, resign by December 31st or um, by June 30th. And then the supplemental benefit would, would begin uh, February 1st and, uh, and August 1st. And again, this would be a supplement to STRS or PER. So the decision is really, uh, you know, based on looking at their, uh, their STRS and PERS benefits, what's being offered here, and making a decision. So uh, we analyzed several different benefit levels, uh, but the one that we proposed based on looking at the analysis in terms of fiscal projected fiscal savings is a 70% of final pay. That is the same benefit that was offered uh, in, the, in the previous uh, CERP. Uh, and uh, it would be funded through a 403B incentive under 403B rules. Employer contributions are allowed for five years post-employment. So that's the funding vehicle. So um, it allows for the district to fund it over five years. And it allows for various distribution options for the participants, including tax deferral uh, and, and you know, various approaches that might fit their needs and help increase participation. So what we did, I'll, and I'll, I'll go here through the analysis in just a minute, but the, the basic analysis we did is we ran out 10 years. What happens if you don't do an incentive? What kind of retirements are you going to get that's going to create savings? And then we superimpose what happens if you do an incentive at this period of time. We compared the two. So what we're looking at is the compensation differential between the retiring employee and the replacement employee, determining if there's any savings there. Then we have to subtract out current natural attrition. In other words, those that would be going this year are a cost under our empirical model of, of looking at this. We're also looking at future uh, loss of natural attrition as a cost as well. So you're basically accelerating your retirements to create savings. And so in future years, you're going to get less retirements than you would ordinarily. And that's the concept behind it, to accelerate retirement attrition and create savings through that. We also obviously have to look at any retirement costs that are accelerated because they're retiring early, uh, the cost of the incentive, the benefit itself. And uh, any savings from either temporarily or permanently non-replacing the positions. And so that's how we derive these, um, these savings or costs, uh, depending on what, what we're looking at. So the assumptions we made, and I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but we assumed eligibility would be uh, eligibility to, or qualification to retire under STRS or PERS. And uh, it's offered to full-time employees, uh, full-time faculty, sorry, education administrators, classified non-management, and classified managers. So the faculty would only be offered in the spring window, but the other groups would be offered uh, with the fall window. And um, so we looked at certain things like how much it would cost to replace, adjunct replacement, for example, for the faculty, their uh, active health benefits, retiree health benefits, and a variety of different assumptions. And we've done this so many times that it's been looked at by many, many colleges and others. And so it's a fairly uh, vigorous empirical model for looking at. It. It's not the same as a cash flow or a budgetary <coughs> model, but, but it is a model for evaluating whether it makes sense to do it. Um, and so uh, the classified non-management, classified managers, uh, that would be the PERS eligibility requirement. And they can, as I mentioned, uh, leave either December 31st or June 30th. So um, if you don't mind going to uh, the handout, which is a, a summary of the, because I, I think you asked for a summary of the savings, um, and then I can go through that a little bit and go through the, each of the groups. Um, but um, on the handout, uh, it shows what our projections are. So we're projecting that... Um, about 20% total of the group eligible, based on the criteria I mentioned, would take. And by group, uh, there's 220 that are eligible. So 87 faculty, we're projecting 21 
retirements, that would be 24% of that particular group. Um, education administrators, that's a smaller group. We're projecting um, one in December, one in June, about 33%. Classified non-management, 112 eligible, projecting eight in December and 11 in June. And um, that's about a 17% uh, uh, take rate. Uh, classified management would be 15 eligible, one uh, in December projected to retire, and, and two in June, so 20%. So in total, it's about 20.45. We try to be very conservative because you're determining whether you want to open a window. We'd rather be on the conservative side. We're looking at um, the demographics, age and service, whether we think, we, we know that there was another incentive offered about um, you know, four years ago. So that factors into our projected rates. We're taking that into consideration and we're looking at all that data. So um, the overall projected savings uh, uh, is is based on 50% roughly replacement for each group except for one. Uh, we're assuming for faculty, one year adjunct replacement for, uh, for all the positions that would be um, retiring and, and, and then full replacement after that. So full-time faculty for all those positions after one, uh, one year. And, uh, so at a, and then 50% of those would be replaced. So uh, that's assuming 10.5 not replaced and creating in the first year 1.1 in savings and over five years 3.3 million in savings. Uh, education administrators were projecting 24,000 in the first year and uh, 70, 721,000 over five years. Classified non-management 123,000. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, because this is based on the mid-year. Um, so it's a half a year. Uh, so for the education ministers, it would be 23,871. Uh, the, the, for one year, it would be 160,000. And then over five years, 721,000. Classified non-management, 123,000 in the mid-year, 617, 18,000 uh, projected in over one year, and then 2.7 million over uh, five years. Classified management, um, confidential, that's a 67% replacement because it's a small group. So it basically would be one non-replacement. So in the, uh, at the mid-year, it would be 11,475, and then 76,000 over one year, and 336,000 over five years. So in total, it would be uh, 158,000 for the first window, so savings created in the second half of the fiscal year, and then projected savings for 2021 would be 1.9 million in total, and 7.1 million projected over five years. And uh, just for a little bit more detail on the analysis we did for the faculty, we, we assume no mid-year savings because it wouldn't be offered mid-year. So starting uh, fiscal year, starting July 1st, 2021, we looked at 100% replacement. That's with one year of adjunct and then full, you know, full-time replacement beginning after the first year. That creates savings with everyone replaced. So, uh, and then we show on down the line to the 50%, 90, 80, 70, 60% number of positions that uh, um, that wouldn't be replaced, and then the projected savings over over that time. So you can see that the faculty group saves with full replacement, and then if there's some level of non-replacement, it saves more. <coughs> and I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but this is uh, basically this eligibility group, um, the age, and so we look at this to determine projected uh, participation as you know as well as you know is this is this a group that might be uh, right for doing an incentive at this point in time and by looking at this we can see that there there's it is definitely a, a group that there's an opportunity for not many times we'll say it, it doesn't seem like it works right now this, this group based on age and then we look at age and service and this again helps us project we're looking at 15 years in particular because retirement eligibility, uh, retiree health care eligibility is there. 
So it helps us with our projections. And uh, um, so, as I mentioned, 87 faculty projected 21 um, to participate uh, at 24 percent. You know, we've done we've done a number of community college districts, and we normally see anywhere from about 20 to 30 percent, but more along the lines of the low 20s take um, when we offer incentive at this level. Again, it, it varies from district to district. So classified non-management, you can see there isn't the salary differentials. You're replacing at about you know 85 percent of, of salary. So for there to be savings, there needs to be some uh, non-replacement occurring, either temporarily or permanently. And so we, we looked at 90, 80, 70, 60, and 50% replacement and uh, looked at savings. So basically, at about two positions, it starts to create savings for, for the district. And again, this is the eligibility group based on age of classified non-management. So there's 112 eligible, and uh, their average age is 59. And we looked at age and service to help make the projections as well, these types of demographics. So uh, this is a group that, um, that a, a retirement center might work with based on this information. So 112, 8 in projected for December, and 11 for June with 19 total projected, and it's a 17%. Uh, participation rate, and this is what we find typically with classified non-management, that they go go at a lower rate of um, participation than other groups. And then we looked at education administrators. This is a smaller group. Um, so we looked at 150 and 0 percent. Um, so uh, you can see because of the replacement costs, they replace at about 90 percent uh, uh, in our assumptions. Uh, so there's no there's no savings created if, if everyone is replaced. It would take a non replacement of one position for savings to be created by that group. And this is the group. So 33 percent, one in December, one in June, two total. 33 percent. These groups are a little harder to project than than larger groups, but. Classified management and confidential. Uh, again, uh, because of their replacement, is, is differential is not there in terms of salary. Uh, if you replace everyone, it, it, it does not create savings. You need to do an, some non-replacement. So one position, 67% replacement, uh, creates savings. And of course, on down the line. So we were looking at 67% or one, per, one position not being replaced. And this is that group as well. So this was uh, eligibility uh, under PERS. So 15 total uh, projected for the December date would be one and for June two. So total three, 20% uh, participation rate. So, uh, and just in before I, you know, get to questions. Uh, so, uh, PARS uh, would would assist in terms of managing the enrollment windows. So, doing the communications, getting the materials out, being uh, available in group meetings, and then on one on one meetings to assist the employees with uh, getting any information that they need to make the decision. We have a call in center in Orange County that literally just deals with. Um, you know, faculty, teachers, education employees, because most of them we do all day long, answering their questions so that they can get their needs met outside of us being on campus. And, and so we'll provide, you know, the types of services that you need uh, to, to, to make sure that the employees get proper information and time to consider the incentive. So it, uh, are there any questions that you have? After looking through, I know there's a lot of numbers there that I threw out at you. I should have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned uh, the point in both windows, and I think these are two separate decisions, one for each window, mm -hmm. where we consider the fiscal impact of what has actually occurred. 
we at the board. Mm -hmm. And you said operational impacts. So my question is, um, are those operational impacts um, the impact on the college of the group that would be leaving beyond the fiscal numbers? Yes, that's why operational is included, fiscal and operational. So once you know the number, who's taking it, which you see the fiscal analysis, but you also need to do an operational analysis if uh, you know if you can follow through on those assumptions, those replacement assumptions or non-replacement assumptions, and if there's some significant operational impact that um, based on individuals who are going, that that would be something that for you to decide. We obviously will can't evaluate. We'll do the fiscal analysis, but you, you can evaluate that. You can ask us to look at you know. Um, individuals that are leaving, what the replacement scenario would be for them, what their specific salary would be, you know, how long it would be before you replace that position. We can do very fine-tuned analysis, but the operational impacts is something that you would need to do. Right. So it's not strictly fiscal. It's right. a decision that could take into consideration the input of our shared governance groups as that decision approaches. Yeah, and that is oftentimes done. Um, and uh, also my question is on the, when you were looking at faculty and you were projecting 21 faculty who would take this, and this is just a projection, mm -hmm. um, does that number include what you might call the background number that would happen anyway without a SERP? Yes. So the, so the fiscal savings subtract out the natural attrition, and what we did is we got data from the last five years, what the attrition was for faculty, and we set a, a natural attrition number. And so, really, those savings are over and above the assumed natural attrition for that group. So I think it was, a, and I have to look at my, I, mean, I think it was about 10 uh, that goes, so really the savings is created by the additional 11 only in our analysis model. Okay, so, Patricia mentioned 14 retirements this year. That would be high. 14, I'm sorry, 14 requests for oh, new requests. and I'm replacement sorry. positions were made to the Senate. And, and that many? includes multiple positions in three departments. So people people indicate to the evening. I can talk, I'm assuming. <laughs> people, um, faculty must submit a notice of retirement to the EVP by, I think, August 31st. That starts a process by which the departments with retirements or the departments that want new positions develop applications that they send to the Academic Senate. We, he we read the applications, we hear presentations, and we rank based on a list, a long list of criteria. But a total of 14 requests were made to the Senate this fall. Okay, so that's helpful. How many retirements? Almost all of them. Do you guys remember? Was it one new faculty? Oh, yeah, one, one. one new, and I think the rest of them were. Oh, exactly. We the Senate allows um, a department to consider a vacancy for two years. So if a person retired in a department last year, but that position wasn't filled, we allow that to carry over for one more year. So the 14 figure actually could include over two years as a replacement. As a replacement. Is that okay, so I'm just trying to figure out yeah, whether... We, we don't have that information, but what we looked at is the last five years, we looked at the bump from the incentive year. And so, you know, and then we saw there was a, a bit of a decrease after that. From But basically we did it average out and... You, you might tweak that. You could have tweaked that assumption and say 11, not 10, but we were just using our judgment based on look, looking <coughs> at past assumption uh, to, to come up with uh, that number. So that you, number is key, is one of the key assumptions, right. what so your natural attrition is. But you're expecting then that the CERP incentive would perhaps take it from an average of 10, natural average, to 21 in this particular year, and then there would be fewer after that. Exactly, and, that's, 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 and that's reflected in the analysis okay. as well. Yeah, you're trying to typically, with an incentive, double natural, natural attrition. If you're not getting much above natural attrition, then it's a cost to offer it. You know, so you, you need to typically get in that neighborhood. 
Any other questions? Trustee Parker. Yes, and I think some of these are going to be for Dr. Benjamin, so I will I will be doing this. <laughs> um, so first of all, I know the the um, administration has been surveying staff, um, getting input on budget reductions. I know that there's also this committee that's been working on it. Um, did the SERP come up in uh, your surveying of staff as a possibility? It did. It came up several times. Okay. Um, then uh, another question I have is on the timing. And I think the reason that this is in a rush, and correct me if I'm wrong, is because um, uh, the district is interested in making an impact on its 1920 budget and not just its 2021 budget. Um, otherwise, this would come have come forward later. And actually, I, um, having been um, part of uh, uh, the equivalent, the Golden Handshake at Santa Barbara Unified uh, a number of times during my tenure there. Um, we did those, I think. <laughs> I, um, I always felt it was um, unethical for it to come late when there were already people that would have been putting in their retirements um, and that, that, um, that was a problem. Um, so I, in some ways, I appreciate the timing, even with, in terms of the discussion. Um, so I, it's great to have a discussion earlier, wherever it goes. Um, but for the timing, it was just for classified for 1920. And faculty, it's retiring for the 2021 school year, correct? Yeah, faculty was the only group excluded from um, yeah. Yeah, the email. So one question I have, I know Liz Auchincloss is not here today. Um, and obviously, she would only be speaking. She's our classified um, uh, head of our classified unit. Um, she would only be speaking in her personal capacity at, at this point, too, because it would also need to go to classified. Um, but was there any feedback from Liz? Or I assume she was notified. Yes, she was. And she, we had our college planning council meeting today where this was discussed. And she indicated in that that classified had expressed interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I just want to say, uh, I so appreciate the feedback from Patricia and Cornelia. Um, I have to say, so 12 years Santa Barbara Unified, I think I was involved with three uh, golden handshakes, and we never had um, a bargaining unit come forward and essentially argue against the financial interests of their employees, of their staff. Um, and so I am so impressed at putting the heart of the college first. Um, and I, it's really helpful to hear um, that it had such an impact. Uh, the last SERP had such an, an impact. Um, I do strongly believe that it is, um, even if it means that we can't move forward um, to make an impact on the 1920 budget, that, that we would need to delay. And I mean, obviously, it's collective bargaining. You know, um, I think it's important um, and necessary, obviously, to go through the collective bargaining process. So um, I think uh, uh, in the next item, we talk about the resolution. Anything that we resolve would have to, it has to be made clear in the resolution that this is contingent on agreement with our employees. Um, and so that's uh, my, my two cents at this point. I had a question, not a comment. Okay. My question is, how were the replacement scenarios chosen? Why were these were the figures? Was it just financial, or is there something behind the 50%, 67%? Who was going to take that question? Yeah, we, we looked at various options, but um, I think District had indicated that that fifty percent was was the most realistic in terms of what they were looking at doing in terms of replacement of those they accept the the incentive. But we gave a kind of almost a menu of replacement options just to just to give a decision making kind of document for for you. It's the last the where asked before the now there be resolved. It's just already in the yeah. Does Kate's In point about the that well, it's contingent? It, it says and or collective yeah. bargaining. So well, I think some people because, who may be eligible are not because the classified is. Yeah. Well, we can talk about that when we get yeah. to the next yeah. item number. But. Would you accept a question from the audience, Mr. President? Go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm seeing this the first time today, and, and I'm trying to make sense out of this, especially since this has been like moved forward in such a rush. So the question for you is, on this document here in the middle column, it says total projected savings in mid-year 2019-20. I assume this is June 30th, 2020. Mid-year 2019-20. Uh, no, it's 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 for this current for this um, current year. year. So for this academic year. year. So so the savings would be created starting January 1st, 2020 through June 30th. So the second half of the fiscal year is what those savings are. And then the new fiscal year would be the second. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, because of the rush and because the intent, I understand, to make a dent into the current year budget deficit. And the current year budget deficit is around three million plus something, right? The dent we are projecting is 158,000. And that is why we are in such a rush. Uh, do we really think that it's worth this bending over backwards and having this done right away then instead of like waiting, think about it, discuss it because of $150,000? A hundred, I just would like to kind of verify this. This is only the only amount that we are saving. Right, over and above your natural attrition, right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? That's not a budget number. That's the empirical analysis that we do in terms of savings. But I, yeah. I trust your numbers, so yeah, this yeah, would be yeah, the yeah. ballpark. Yeah, you get it. Any other uh, questions? Thank you very much. For, oh, we got one. One more. Trustee Nelson. Yeah, just as we go along here. Um, if um, if we didn't implement it now and we didn't start it till whatever we like um, in 2020 for the following year, fiscal or, or fiscal year. You're talking then, about spring? Yeah, spring? yeah, if we didn't spring start it to, fall. yeah, for the fall. Yeah. If we didn't start it till later, would that would that impact our second year numbers? I uh, yes, the second by, a, by more than one hundred fifty thousand. <coughs> uh, yes, um, so if you just offered the spring window and not the fall window, your savings would begin um, uh -huh. July first, and you would have you know potential. Obviously, we would, we would project a little differently because you're not going to have the December window, so you might right. have more people go go out in the spring. So yeah, we would analyze that to determine that they're, they're, what the savings would be for 2021 and going out you know, the next 10 years or such. There's actually usually a greater savings in year six because you've finished paying off the incentive, but we typically don't like to go out past five years even though we've analyzed it because you know, it, it's, it's difficult to look past five years. You know, you know. But it would be something less than the 1.9 million that you show for projected savings in year one. In other words, or would it be more? It would be more. Yeah, I would, I would have to, I could, it would be very simple to look at those numbers for you. You could do it very quickly. Yeah. First you move. I, Maybe the language on the sheet already answers my question, but when it says projected savings over three years, so the 4.4 .4 million and the 7.1, those are aggregate savings. So yes, exactly. it's not the annual savings exactly. we'd be helping with our budget deficit. It's, so it's not like $4 million of yeah, budget deficit's it's gone. It's accumulated. It's, okay. Yeah. And again, I mentioned this isn't cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I assume you'll stay with us in case we yeah, sure. have uh, further questions as we uh, deliberate. So, does anybody want to make a motion for resolution? Yes, Trustee. Well, I'd like to talk about it, I think, in this case a little bit more before I make a resolution. Okay. Sure. Well, I, we can make the motion a second and, and discuss. Then we could have a discussion. Yeah. So I think the motion should be contingent upon uh, collective bargaining. Yeah. Right? Yes. Um, well, then, um, for that, I would make a motion um, 
to pass uh, the resolution of the governing board number twenty uh, number one 2019-20 with one amendment, and that is on, on number one. Um, uh, just to, I know that it's in the whereas, but just to be really clear that it says the governing board of trustees of the district hereby adopts the PAR supplementary retirement plan pending collective bargaining agreement as part of the district's retirement pro program, effective X date 2019. And just to make sure it's in the resolution itself and not just a whereas. Um, um, especially if the collective bargaining decides against it. Um, and this is a case where I, I, um, I am mindful that this is essentially an employee decision at this point. Um, and um, that uh, I'm also really mindful that classified is not here um, to talk about this um, and that it's classified that's affected uh, if whether or not it goes quickly because it's the first um, this fall date and the reason we're doing it now is to benefit our classified employees um, and hence my motion as it stands. I want to thank you for, uh, for your comments. There's most enlightening and good discussion so far. I, I feel like um, uh, the whereas pretty much covers it, but you, your um, introduction in the beginning was more information, which is fine. Maybe a little bit shorter and referring to the whereas to follow um, is another way to do it. Either way is fine by me. Um, I... As long as it's contingent on their approval, if they don't like it, then it, then it basically doesn't happen. Um, they seem to like it so far, but time will tell. Um, so that's it. I, I'm kind of more concerned about um, the lack of immediate or you know, significant impact you know, on the budget immediately. But... We've got to pare things down any way we can do it. That's less painful is better than doing it. That people might view as being more painful, and nobody's going to really like it because time frames, everybody's time frames are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to cause the least disruption and provide for proper processing, which I think we've done here, I. Um, are you seconding the motion? I think I'm going to second the motion to just approve it with that, with your recommendation. And if it could be done a little shorter or briefer, fine. But I'm not against what you're suggesting. Basically, <laughs> same condition. Um. So we have discussion, Trustee Croninger. Um Question uh, or clarification: The um, collective bargaining is obviously a condition of this. Um, if the collective bargaining results are different and the classified, for example, decide that they would like to go ahead but the faculty does not, do we have the ability to offer a more limited SERP to a particular uh, employee group? I have that same question. That's what we're well, we have at. to see if it's going to be beneficial. It right. may not... Operational and physical. But right. Is it possible, as we seem to have already done, to split the employees yes. based on their response. I think anything's possible. Yeah, it's up to you how, how you want to do that. So you, you can do that. And uh, in my experience, that, that happens sometimes. So you can several proceed. groups will do it, and some, yeah. some groups they will not do it. So You can proceed with some but not others, depending on the response. Mm -hmm. yeah. which, which brings me back if I could, to my thinking about um, if, if we have a lot of disruption um, in some departments or areas where replacement's difficult, can we just eliminate that particular one temporarily or delay it, or do we have to cancel the offering to that whole employee group? Well, we, we'll have a goal that we need to reach in order to save money. And if yeah. we don't reach the goal, then we don't move forward yeah. with the plan. That's how it works, because it's not advantageous I, if you don't reach the goal. I agree. Yeah, and I... I was just exploring in my mind, mm -hmm. um, yeah. based on um, by what uh, faculty had had stated, and um, which I highly respect the faculty. They've done a lot of good things in, in this college, and um, I uh, they made us number one, not anybody else. It was the faculty. 
I and their cooperation. Um, the biggest reason we're doing this is because we've got to come up with, we've got to get efficiency up, we've got to get this college, we've got to eliminate this ongoing recurring deficit, and we're not the only college and school in this situation with the declining enrollment. However, things will change, and then it'll get really difficult for a while before they get better again. And um, But we've got to address this now, or we're going to have a big problem trying to get through the change to, in order to keep the college going and operating when, when enrollment starts to pick up again. Um, we won't have what we need to do that with, and it'll be very painful. Um, and in the past, over a few decades, I've witnessed, uh, you know, a lot of classes not being offered, things being cut back, and that limits opportunity the district we serve. So no matter what decision we make, I guess it's not perfect for everybody, but we need to maintain the college um, and do our very best not to disrupt the good intents of our faculty and, and our staff. Um, I don't see the only the only drawback I see to this at all is that some people are going to be at this time there are going to be a few people that are going to be difficult to replace, but that's why we pay administrators like our current president um, the big bucks go find the people <laughs> make it happen. I don't know what else we can do. It we we've got to do all these little pieces in order to stem what's happening. And, you know, I'm not against spending, using the reserves, but we've got to stop the ongoing, you know, bleeding. Um, I don't, I'm not impressed with the 158,000 here projection for the first year. However, without that, we give up a chunk of the remaining. So, That's what I had to say. That's what's going through my mind. I, I We've got to do everything we can to try to help this along and, and to get the situation Dr. changed. Dr. Benjamin, you sought uh, input from uh, faculty and staff on suggestions for dealing with the budget, oh, correct? Yes, we had a while ago. We yeah. did. And and how did... And SERP was mentioned. Can I speak? Can SERP was... SERP. Pardon? Can I speak to this? Well, let me this finish my question, okay, please. And SERP was was mentioned by by a number? Yes, it was suggested. I I think yes, I'm sure it was. Okay. Several times. Yes. Okay. I sent the list out to the whole college, everybody, and now we have um, the we've taken that we were working the list through governance. I reported to you last week in the third board meeting that I have a group uh, from college, our college planning council, how they've organized themselves, they've come themselves and they've come up with a great plan. But I have to share with you that today, and we were in that meeting, that's why we were late for this meeting because we were in our governance meeting. Uh, they expressed serious concern about uh, the CERP it, to them and I can understand it. They feel that this kind of defeats their work that, they, that they've taken very, very seriously. They're not as encouraged in working through their plan to come up with this list that I was going to present to you in the November meeting for your response because they were going to attach numbers to all the recommendations and so um, they're a little deflated because of this particular thing. Uh, but I said to them that I think we need all of these. I don't know that the SERP will solve the problem. I don't think that one thing will. There are just a lot of things that we need to do in this regard. So. Well, as it stands right now, Lindsay just walked out, but our percentage of salaries and benefits right now, it's beyond the 80%. It's 91%. Yeah. So that's that's the golden, that's it. It's 91%. That's not even, I never even imagined that that would ever. Back five years ago, we were concerned with 85%, 87%. I mean, that was like our healthy, um, when the conversations around stirs and purrs. I mean, I felt like we spent years knowing that this was going to happen, and the golden um, timeline was 2021. And I remember that because my daughter was going to graduate from high school, and I'm like, gosh, 2021. But this all just kept creeping, creeping. And so 91% of our total budget is not sustainable. It's salaries and benefits. Yeah, salaries yes. and benefits. <laughs> 
So that's like you mentioned at the or somebody mentioned that's the only place to go right now. So. I have uh, some comments and some questions. The first is, um, how is the operational analysis impact going to be done once we know uh, how many people took? What's what's the process for that? I, I couldn't tell you right you now don't because have, I have no idea. Okay. Well, we have to keep in mind, too, the college is going through the whole guided pathways, and I think everything we've been hearing about re-envisioning. I mean, so this just seems like, again, that whole thing where good things are going to you know, be moved around so that better things can slowly get propped up with how we're re-envisioning that guide pathways. Being mindful with public education, I know. Um. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not done with my questions. Mm -hmm. I know, um, the thing that bothers me about it is that people are upset about yeah. what we're doing. And I didn't properly engage everybody. I just didn't feel that I had time to do that. Um, and we still have time to do that, I suppose. But it won't be the same. I guess my similar question is, how is the collective bargaining negotiation going to work out for this specifically? Is it going to be part of the regular collect? I mean, I, we're already done with CSEA. So how is this yeah, going this to be has to be special. A special one done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what would be the timeline for that? Immediate. Done? Immediate. Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm voting no because I think our budget directive in the minutes, which I just checked, was to work to close the deficit, but with no timeline. So I don't think, I think it's a false choice that it's like layoffs or CERT, because it's not. Our, we have three million to use for our, from our reserves for this year. I think there's no rush in getting it done today because it's only 158,000. If we vote today, if we continue the conversation, we might still get the bigger savings. We might get a different result of what's being proposed, but I don't see the need to vote yes on this today. And there's been enough concern and heartache about this that I don't uh, I don't really feel strongly about voting yes and I'm going to vote no. Are you suggesting that it would be something we would then take up in a month or two months or what, what is your concept of when you say not doing it today? Well I think we could talk about I think the conversation should still happen on campus with uh, representative groups on this matter and then whenever the okay let's see today's October 15th, and this would open October 22nd. So we really have until like January to make a decision if we want to do this. I think it's worth waiting till January or even December or so something. Not today, just because people haven't had a chance to really talk about it, and there's not a really great benefit from doing it today. $158,000, again, our reserves $27 million. That's our of our budget. That's like one per less than 1% of our budget. So if we wait till January, though, we... We've given up the whole 158, right? Uh, yes. Either have given it up or it rolls into the next one. Either way, yeah. it's pennies yeah. compared to... But it's not, it's not savings we will achieve in this fiscal year. Yeah, which I think we don't need to achieve any savings this fiscal year. We have $3 million in our budget already allocated to cover the deficit. We have $27 million in reserve. We already made the decision as a board to approve our budget with the deficit. And so I don't need see the need to have to reduce the deficit so immediately this fiscal year. <coughs> I just think we can wait a little longer, make a better decision later, maybe have savings slightly different, slightly more. She said slightly more if we took it out of this year. There's just no need. I mean, I'll pay $158,000 to be able to have a better decision at the end of the day out of our $27 million reserve. I thought you were going to say out of your own pocket. I was going to second that. If I had <laughs> that, let's write it. But no. Yeah, I'm waiting for your check. Trustee yeah. <laughs> um, Uh I appreciate uh, the concerns that have been expressed uh, by Cornelia and by uh, Patricia. Um, they are obviously serious and passionate concerns. Um, but I'm looking to the question of whether or not we can accommodate the need for these discussions as we move forward. I mean, as Kate has pointed out, um, we don't have our classified group here. They are the ones that are in that first contingent. Um, they, too, need the opportunity to decide whether they like it or don't like it. And so voting no takes that away from them. Um, that removes the option for them who may or may not like it. I don't know the answer to that. But I'm wondering if, Helen, you feel that we can 
um, develop that process of, of assessing operational impact, assessing the, uh, going through the collective bargaining for each group during the time that we're moving toward a decision as a board to do it or not do it. Simultaneously? Simultaneously, yeah. Concurrently, can we... I mean, well, if the we're operational, looking... You, you can't assess the operational impact, especially on the faculty side, until you know what positions... No, no. I'm t we have two decisions. One, the first one is the classified window. The window one, you mean? Window one. Uh -huh. And so we are going to want to assess fiscal and operational impacts on that group mm -hmm. before deciding whether to go forward. And that is, I don't know when, let's see, board decides? December 11th. December 11th. Okay, so between now and December 11th, that's focus one. Focus mm -hmm. two is that we are doing collective bargaining for all groups concurrently, mm -hmm. with or, or not this goes forward. And um, that includes the whole faculty component that would be the following For the spring. Year. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if we have enough time to put together that kind of discussion. That I mean, what really I hear fundamentally is people want a chance to get together, talk about it, think it through, discuss it, and as well, the operational impact depends on who elects. Mm -hmm. right. Really critically depends on who elects. Until we know that, we're shooting in the dark. And so yeah, we may not get enough. Well, that's a that's a really great point. So is the idea then that classified would need to move quickly to decide whether or not they wanted to participate in window one? Um, but uh, and this is I think a question for you. Um, but if Certificate. Uh, if faculty needed more time, um, what would be the deadline for them to make their decision um, before we decided whether or not window two went forward? Right. Based on this uh, proposed timeline, and it can be adjusted, but uh, the window would open February 12th and close by March 31st. Um, and so with the window opening, uh, Decision and it could be pushed back a little bit to March or so, but um, you, you'd probably you know want to, want to have made the decision by sometime by the end of February, and and, and then open the window once the decision's made. Mm -hmm. Plan for that. I know they that the the year ends March uh, May 9th, so you have to make sure you fit it into that. Give them time, and give time for the board to decide before they go. You know, and the academic year. So essentially, faculty have a few months before they would need to get back to us to say whether or not they agree to this and whether or not window two is going to open for faculty. Right. So there's time for that conversation to happen. Okay. And the good. communications would be based, you know, at the beginning of the window on who, whoever it's being offered to, the eligibility group. All that can be changed. Oftentimes, with the second window, there are changes like that that occur. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Was, yeah, that was an encouraging uh, point. Um, I, I'm, I feel like voting yes because there is time to discuss all this, and the board did give the president, our president, uh, um, the the intent to communicate the intent to act um, quickly as quickly as possible to achieve the maximum possible results. And there is no one way, one one single action in s to achieve that mm -hmm. impact on the budget. So a whole we've been doing a whole lot of things. And I don't see, since faculty has well, plenty of time to accept or reject or to give us input, it requires our final improvement to uh, approval to succeed. I don't see a reason of this other than like emotions or showing concern to others beyond the whereases um, as a reason not to proceed. I think um, proceeding is only acting in the best interests of the district that we serve. And um, I have a little faith in our in our in um, in our faculty 
and the leaders of this college and um, our administration, especially our current acting president, to uh, set this up in a proper way and not, uh, not to do anything that's improper. Um, so I would vote yes at this point just to share my uh, opinion. And um, I love it when everybody else asks questions because I can think more stuff. Maybe I missed something. Could, Kate, could you restate your proposed amendment? And it was under item one. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved that one, the governing board of trustees of the district hereby adopts the PARS supplementary retirement float plan. Um, what did I say? Pending, Pending uh, collective bargaining agreement. Or subject to. Subject to. Or subject to. Collective bargaining agreement with each, how about with each bargaining unit, just to make sure that we're separating them all out in terms That's of That's a great making. amendment. And she'll let the two lawyers <coughs> <also>. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or it's making. Are you, you like that? Oh, no, it's just, I just <laughs> love that. That's always a good Did you get that, Robert? Say it again. So it was her. So for each bargaining unit. Um, uh, selected yeah. to the, yeah, to the collective bargaining agreement. For each bargaining unit. Bargain. So one more question I have then. As I understand it, I don't want to make this, get this clear in my head. We could, we could elect to proceed even, even without, um, even if we needed to omit one of the groups. If it, if it, fine, if it, it worked out sense. physically. Mm -hmm. um, okay, if we if we have that kind of flexibility, I see no reason to uh, to delay considering what our mission and goal is. Mm -hmm. That includes a financial as well as operational analysis. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those are in the whereas's. So. Yep. So I don't, I don't, I'm not an attorney, but it doesn't look like we're violating anything. Can I ask one, one question, just one follow-up question? If, if faculty has until March, what is it, 30th, to declare whether they will retire, is that correct, under the amended March 31st? 31st. So between March 31st and the end of the semester, our new president will conduct an operational investigation into whether this is feasible and after March 31st that's when you guys will make your final decision April 9th is on the, is the schedule so have. you've got between March 30th and April 9th to do an operational investigation on the impact of faculty and whether it will be an operational detriment that, that's just a proposed date you can um, you can uh, you know be further back, delay it in, in April. Um, this is just a proposed timeline right now, um, but if, a, April 9th is, is not set in stone. So could it be the end of April or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Or even into May? It's as long as we're ahead of the It's end a of very short window. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's only before they go out, you know, after, after, after May 9th would not be good to, to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, by the motion, if the motion passes, are we accepting this schedule? Is that no, the no, schedule no. is not part of it. It's just so, a resolution. So that can be, we don't have to amend the motion to deal with that. Well, that's like the weeds. I mean, what are we going to yeah. do? Well, my comment on that would be we have, that may be the window to, to do the actual analysis and make a decision, but the exact process by which that is done, we have a good deal of time for administration to come up with that process so that it won't be like trying to invent the process and do it in a matter of days. It will be plugging the numbers in. Um, I don't see a problem. I also, uh, because we have speakers here that are present, I also um, don't, uh, or I, I appreciate the concern, but I really, the there's everybody wins with this except if it causes institutional disruption. Some employees will win. It's a, to their advantage if they choose to, if they choose it. Some will choose not to. Um, and nobody's being forced to do this. So the only the only drawbacks that I really see here that can happen is it's going to affect 
depending on who elects to take it, um, it could it could affect the op, the the ability of the college to produce its product that, and meet its goals. And if that's if that's a disruption, then we've allowed for that to be evaluated in this. It looks like. So, um, with that being said, I. I know it would have been really nice if we were just thinking about doing this a year from now and pass it on through. We probably should have looked at this again six months ago and it would have been less painful for everybody and it wouldn't be like a surprise. But it actually, I just thought I'd just make those points public and, and let everybody know that we're, we're, not, we're not like deaf to the people that came and spoke Before to us. Before we trust you, Colonel. Well, I was just going to say, I'm envisioning there's two windows here. The one that we were just talking about with Patricia, where we know who's elected and we look at specific people and operational impacts. But there's also the collective bargaining window, which I would understand to be if this were adopted from today through till middle or end of February, where that discussion occurs in time for being in front of an enrollment packet um, for each of the groups, basically. Um, so that's the general discussion about what does it mean for the institution in a general way. And then there's a second specific discussion, as I understand it. So, I'm just so be before we get to a vote, does Trustee uh, Meshi have any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I don't because I'm not supposed to engage in employee bargaining processes. He's learning. I am. I am very concerned about how this would affect student success. In that, um, full-time faculty might not get replaced early, and we're not sure about the quality of adjunct faculty who might get to replace the very experienced full-time faculty that might get to take this. So. I'm very bothered about student, how this might affect student success and also knowing that we are working under a student success standard funding formula. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, apart from that, I think also the fact that this didn't go to the groups for discussion also, I think that is a, a very huge concern for me. And I will personally put me on this out of respect for those groups that didn't get to see this early. And didn't have this discussion prior to this time, so I would vote so. Thank you. Do you need me to officially change the motion to include Marsha's language, or is it okay just to move forward through unanimous? If you want to restate it, just for... If you could restate it. it. Okay, I will restate the motion um, to include in line number one, now therefore be it resolved, that the Governing Board of Trustees of the District hereby adopts the PARS Supplementary Retirement Plan subject to the collective bargaining agreement of all district bargaining units as part of the district retirement program, effective whatever today is, October 15th. Yeah, I think they said each bargaining unit. Just uh, of each bargaining yes. union. Yes. Sorry, that's a better way of putting it. Okay. Each bargaining union. Sounds good. I, I, I agree. Still second. Okay. Second. So... <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, all those in favor. Oh, it's a roll call. It's a roll call. Yeah. It's a roll call. <laughs> but we I'm haven't not gonna... done one in a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, uh, do you call it out? Yeah, or... I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. Trustee of... Oh, wait, excuse me. Uh, student trustee of Betsy. No. Trustee of... No. Trustee Parker. Yes. Trustee Croninger. Yes. Trustee Gallardo. Yes. Trustee Nielsen? Yes. Trustee Miller? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. We may be done. <clears throat> We're not doing this. No. Yeah. Okay. It'll be on the next on the November agenda. Do we have a uh, motion to adjourn? So we're skipping item four point three. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so moved.
maybe just before we do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an agendized, but it's it's certainly part of our discussion that we just had. And I would say that maybe by general consensus, we could encourage the idea of a robust discussion with our our folks about this, sir. Does anybody disagree? I think that everybody here wants that. So. What do you mean? A robust discussion, in, in both in the collective bargaining sense and in the collective, in the sense of when we know who it is who is stepping up. Um, I think that that both of those are really important discussions. So I would just say, as a sense of the board's views on that, right? That's a good idea. You said I think once you hand out the actual en enrollment, you're going to make an informed decision, and you're going to know what you see. So it's like I think for the employee group. I mean, I know if someone was offering this to me, and it's one thing to hear it here, but then if you're looking at oh, for my future, this is what I'm thinking. It's a different conversation when someone has to in their hand and they can make decisions for their well-being and their family and their future. And so I think that that's... Right. There's good. the institutional discussion. There's the individual discussion. There's the collective bargaining discussion. There's a lot of discussion here. At Santa Barbara <laughs> City College. Yes. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I have a kind of a request of the administration. If, um, if somebody could round up a history of uh, the percentages, like we're at 91%, where the ideal percentage is, why why those numbers were chosen, why the views on what percentage of our overhead should be, you know, is okay for uh, faculty and staff versus other things, and where we're at now in relation to the norm and how the norm was established, and some history. We could point to what happened at San Francisco City College and other campuses that have gotten out of whack with the with the percentages. But I think a general a release of a compendium of, uh, of uh, history, historical cases and reasoning for how things were done. And I don't propose that our administration should be responsible for writing that. But I think they could, without too terribly much trouble, with a little help, um, come up with a collection of information that we could make locally available, even on our website. Um, that everybody could access, and I think it would. I think the more information we share, and about the reasoning and the history and why we're doing it, or what the goals are, or reasons for the goals being set the way they are, I think um, only adds to increase the spirit of cooperation to solve problems. And mostly right now, we're looking at solving problems before they become acute. That's the reason. Um, and why we see it that way, I think a little history is a really good, is a really good thing just to share, because uh, you know people know this stuff, but it they don't. It's not, it's not current. It's not what's in their head right now. So I think just putting the information out there, talking about it, it's like my background's in marketing. So if I want to sell something to somebody. The example of how I would do that is basically found in a 20-second TV commercial. You say the same thing seven times, maybe in different words, but you repeat. Bring it out, put it in the open, let people address it, and look at what, what we're doing. And I think a lot of what this college has done to get where we're going has done, has done it because it's produced some really good results. Um, and so there's good, valid reasons for how it how it's getting where it's going, but we've also got to do what's sustainable. Um, and, and so a really good, give, putting the information out there is only going to generate better discussion, I feel like. Is that an unreasonable request, Dr. Benjamin? I will help you dig up some of the FICMAC documents we got, because I feel yeah. like we have that. Why don't we... We'll do a we already book. have this stuff. I don't. We'll do a book club, work. and then we'll, we'll come do to a book you. Club? Yeah, oh, okay. you and I will do a book club, and then we'll come Thank to you. you. Yeah, okay. don't want to give you more work. I just we just. Oh don't. yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess I do. You do. <laughs> so Thank I you for everything. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Yeah, motion second. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.